Uh, we'll get started. Um, I want to introduce myself. My name is Cherie, and I am with a company called Simply Funded, and we are proud sponsors of GRID. Uh, we are the mortgage and lending and hard money, and you can just call me the money lady, uh, sponsor within the Gridiverse. Uh, and once a month, I'm going to be coming on with another person in order to talk about some aspect of real estate investing. And this month we are going to talk about house hacking. And in order to do that, we have the house hack king here himself, uh, a gentleman named Mike Weber. So Mike, do you want to introduce yourself? Yep. My name is Mike Weber. I'm an agent with the Casa Group. Uh, before I became an agent, I was a real estate investor Pretty traditional path, W-2 job, started investing in real estate, really enjoyed it, loved it. Um, and I decided I just want to dive into this full time and I want to help other people invest in real estate. So now I'm a full time agent. About 80 percent of my clients are investors. Um, if they're not buying an investment property, they're investment minded, they want a house hack. Want to, want to hold the property after they move, turn it into a rental, that type of thing. Um, you know, and I still work with traditional buyers and sellers, of course, but uh, but my focus is is on the investor community and working with them. And my specialty is house hacking. Yeah. So um, why don't you start off just explaining to everybody what house hacking is? Um <laughs> Absolutely. In this, in the most simple terms, it is monetizing your primary residence. Most people think of house hacking, they think of like, I'm going to buy a duplex, live in one side and rent out the other side. And that's probably nationally the most common way of doing it. Um, you know, in Northern Virginia, if any of you are up here, I'm sure you've seen, we don't have much multifamily. So people get a little bit more creative. But it's just monetizing your primary residence, renting out a portion of the house. I've seen people rent out their garages. I've seen people rent out their yard, to, basically as like a dog park. Um, I mean, you can get pretty creative with it. But generally speaking, it's just monetizing the primary residence. The most common way is renting out either, you know, half of your duplex, or if you have a single family or townhome, renting out rooms, renting out the basement, but it's just bringing money in to offset your mortgage, really. Yeah, another popular one is uh, ADUs, accessory dwelling units as well, um, is where people will uh, rent those out. So um, so tell everybody, Mike, a little bit about, like, from a realtor's <laughs> point of view, um, if somebody were to say, hey, you know, I'm considering house hacking, what are some of the questions that you would <laughs> ask them and encourage them to ask themselves if, as they're thinking about the best houses and the best layouts or just, you know, anything like that, that you're able to give us? Absolutely. That's a great question because you might be surprised. Not many people ask themselves this question. So it's the first thing that I pose to them. Where do you fall on the comfort continuum? And what I mean by that is the more the more income that you want your home to generate, the the less comfortable you're going to be in the home. And that's that's just a fact. If you want to live in one room and, and put bunk beds in every room and rent out by the bed and have eight roommates, you can absolutely do that. I don't want to do that at this point in my life, but you can probably all completely offset your mortgage and maybe even cash flow it. Now on the far side, do you want complete separation? You don't want roommates. You don't you don't even want to know that there's somebody else in your home. You can rent, you know, the duplex, rent out the other side, rent out a basement that has a separate entrance. So the first thing I ask them is how comfortable are you going to be with either a roommate? Do you need full separation? Where do you kind of fall in that comfort continuum? And and I have clients that say, I don't want to even know that there's someone else in the house. I want to rent out the basement with a separate entrance. It has a kitchenette. There'll be laundry either upstairs and downstairs or in some sort of mud room that you don't have to ever cross paths. And then other people are like, 
dude, I, I'm I'm 21. I was ju I just got out of college and I had a bunch of roommates and I'm cool with doing that again. So I just want to make as much money as possible. And then we kind of, you know, we strategize from there of, of, okay, here's the options. Here's how we do that. But that's always the first question I ask because a lot of people don't think about it. They just think, oh, I want a house hack. But then when you say, do you want roommates? They stop, they pause, they think about it and say, absolutely not. I'm not, I don't want to do that. So that's the first thing you should be thinking of if you want to know, Zach. How comfortable are you with living with other people? Um, what other questions? What other questions should people think about? Rental strategy. So let's say you want a house act. Let's say that you do want complete separation, for example. It doesn't matter if you do or don't. Um, do you want a long-term tenant? 12-month leases. You know what you're getting but the money will be a little bit less. You can furnish an area and rent out midterm and make a lot more money. But rather than having one tenant a year, you're going to have somewhere in the ballpark between three to eight. Uh, Delonta, me, can you, can you mute please? Go ahead, Mike. Uh, I thought I was asking a question, but yeah. So the rental strategy would be the next thing that you want to look into. Like how, how do you want to rent to your tenants, whether it's short-term, mid-term, long-term um, that, that would really be the next one. That that's an important one too. And all of this, just keeping in mind, this isn't just a rental property. This is your primary residence. So this kind of goes after we have the discussion of like, what do you need? Like, what do you personally need you know, location wise, beds and bath wise. When I talk to somebody about house hacking, like once I determine if they are okay with roommates, we'll go one route. If I'm, if they don't want roommates and they want complete separation, then the next question is, well, what do you need? And sometimes they'll say, oh, I need a, I need a two bed, two bath for, for themselves. And then we look for places that can accommodate that and then also have rentable space. Yeah, one of the things that you and I talked about when I first spoke with you about this is um, security and feeling secure as a woman. And I was very nervous because there are landlord laws out there that say that you cannot discriminate against people. And you said, but Cherie, you don't have to have a man live with you. You can say as your primary residence that I only want women living here and that is legal um, if you're living in the space. Can you talk about that a little bit more with regard to safety concerns that people may have? Yes, absolutely. You are completely free from fair housing laws if you're living in the home, if, if it's your primary residence and you're house hacking. And that is the number one worry that I get from tenants is, is the one that you described. I've had some other like uh, rare versions of that where they have a specific, you know, I've had one person, they want to live with someone from their country and that's fine. They can do that. Like, I was like, that's okay. In a normal, like if you were just a landlord said, I only want to rent to people from my country, that's a different story. Like that's a fair housing violation. But if you're living in the home, you can do that. And I've had a lot of women, it, over over half of my house at clients have been women, single women. And that's a big thing for a lot of them is I don't feel comfortable living with them some man in the house and you don't have to you're not subject to fair housing laws you can rent to whoever you want get specific as you want no men no men need apply can literally be a part of your your rental listing um you know it so you don't have to worry about things like that and what i tell people if you're house hacking you go you go through the same steps as a typical rental but i always i, I urge people and i think it's important to do an in-person interview for anybody that's going to be living in your home. And we've evolved to have instincts and, you know, trust your gut. If you get a weird vibe from somebody, even if on paper they work, th you're living with this person. You, you don't want to rent to somebody that you don't feel comfortable around or that you get an unsettling feeling from. So uh, you can just pass on them and, and, and find the next person. Whereas, again, if it's just a rental and you're just a landlord, you don't live in the house, I would, I, I, I don't, I don't even want to see the tenant. 
you know, like, because all it can do is potentially complicate things if they get denied. You know, like, I don't, I want to know as little about, I just want to know their credit, their income, their rental history, that's it. Um, but when you're living in the house, like, you actually, you know, you want to kind of do like a vibe check and be like, hey, is, is this someone that I actually want to be my roommate or live in my basement? And if the answer is no, just move on and find someone that you're comfortable with. So what are some of the ways that people can find tenants? Facebook Marketplace is a surprisingly good place to find tenants. It's one of the best, I would say. Um, the majority of my clients have found people through Facebook Marketplace. If you have friends or family, or if you're at that stage of your life where you're you're young, and you, or even if you're older and you still have a close group of friends, um, renting to friends is like, I is... I've just seen it work so many times. Some people would say, oh, like living with friends might be tough, but I've just seen it work time and time again. In a lot of cases, they are they were already roommates renting together. And one of them was like, I'm going to buy a house. Do you want to come with me and just rent a room in, in my house? And the answer is yes. And it's like a win-win. You know, it's not now you're building equity. You're a homeowner and you still have your buddy that you were living with already. Um but outside of like your sphere or people that you know, your network, Facebook Marketplace is great. I've seen people get people on Zillow. If you're going for a short or midterm strategy, you want to be on Airbnb and for mid midterm Airbnb and Furnished Finder are probably the two best. Um, they they they're they're the two single best plat like two best platforms for short and midterm rentals like bar none. You know, one of my clients, um, she owned a house and she had uh, found people on Airbnb and they did month to month leases. Mm -hmm. So because she wanted to have the ability, if she needed to evict somebody at any point, she would be able to do that without a lot of, of uh, hassle or issues. And she actually set it up where they paid her through Airbnb as well, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, what other like options have you seen people do with regards to like, you know, setting up rules within the house or like you, cause you mentioned the comfort continuum, like how, how do people think about like setting up the rules within the house, getting paid, um, the rent, things like that? Yeah, um, I'm going to answer that. But just before I forget, I, I want to touch on something that you just said about the month to month leases. If you are a little bit unsure of how comfortable you're going to be with somebody in the house, whether it's whether it's a roommate or you're renting the basement, if you're a first time house hacker and, and you've never been through it before, I love the month to month lease. I love starting out with that because you might decide this isn't for me or with the roommates doing a midterm rental. Likely they're going to be there between 30 and 90 days. It's like a trial period. Like, Hey, is this really for you? I know, I know you said that you're okay with roommates and you, and you think you're okay with roommates and you're going to make more money that way. And that's probably what's attracting you to it. You know, if you made less money, no, nobody chooses to have a roommate to make less money typically. Um, so a lot of people, they see the money, they see the dollar signs. They're like, I want to rent by the room. I'm going to live in the master. I have three other bedrooms. I'm going to rent those out. If, if you start with 12 month leases and now you have three roommates that are there for a year and you two months in, you're like, this isn't for me. You're in for 10 months of maybe not loving where you live anymore. You know, so I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of, of those month to month leases, especially when you're first starting out. And if you're like a little bit on the fence of like, mm, am I going to be comfortable with this? Am I not going to be comfortable with this? Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to say, like, I, I would suggest that to anybody who isn't quite sure that they want to do the roommate route, um, but want to give it a shot. Don't lock in for a year. Like, don't don't put yourself through that potentially. Um, I'm sorry. What was your question again? I just asked about the process of setting up rules, um, the process of getting paid, any other little tidbits that you have. And then we are going to open it up for questions uh, that the audience may have uh, with regard to that piece of it. Yes. There's, there's several ways of going about that. One, most of my clients that I use, I send them the standard uh, Virginia tenant landlord agreement. Um, they use that and then they'll and then they'll include an addendum that basically outlines the areas of the house that are theirs, whether it's a room, 
or whether it's the basement and then any shared spaces. And, and, and like any other tenant, they have a right to those spaces. If you're putting it in their lease that it's the shared kitchen and you you know, you want to have a date over or something and they're in the kitchen, you know, you can't tell them to beat it. Like it's their kitchen too, you know? So like just keeping all of that in mind, but you do want to have it outlined in a lease. The, the Virginia, the standard Virginia lease, you know, it's held up in court a million times. It's pretty, you know, boilerplate stuff. So I like to use that. And then just including an addendum for the areas and, and you know, any house, house rules, if you want to implement something like that. Um, I don't typically see anything out of the norm it, it, unless you're doing it by the room long-term leases. In that case, sometimes people will want to kind of put house rules in place. And that's up to you. It's just a lease agreement as long as, long as you're not, you know, breaking the law or anything like that, obviously. Like as long as everything that's in there is legal, um, you, can, you can pretty much put any of that in the lease. Um, but just have it as an addendum. Use the standard lease for like 90% of it just because it's, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's held up in court, you know, drawn up by attorneys, like it's the real deal. Um, and then how you set it up is up to you. I've had some people who, after they buy the house, they put it in an LLC and they try to run it like a real business, you know, even though it's just their primary residence. Um, I've had a, most people just keep it in their own names and, you know, they, they just set up a a payment system. I've seen people take money on Venmo. You can set their software out there. there. There's platforms that, you know, allow you to kind of track your tenants more. If you're doing the shorter midterm, Airbnb and, and Furnish Finder will, will actually help you with a lot of that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of options out there for, for that type of thing. Right. So um, I am going to answer Chuck's question really quickly. And um, I actually, uh, I think I'm going to introduce the funding portion of this and then we'll open it up for questions. So Chuck's question is a great one about uh, must one use conventional lending institutions since it's owner occupied or can private money be used since it's an investment property to finance a house hack? So I am on both sides of the equation. I am licensed, so I do conventional loans, VA, FHA. I also am on the other side doing hard money and, and private loans. I will tell you this about private lenders. The super, super majority of private lenders do not want to loan on an owner-occupied house because it is it, because it is infinitely harder to foreclose on an owner-occupied house than it is a in pure investment property where you're not going to live. Um, also, private lenders tend to want you to have more of a down payment than conventional FHA, VA loans. Right. Uh, even your bank statement loans will typically be anywhere from 10 to 20% down. You know, an answer. Um, Craig? You're welcome. Right. Oh, <laughs> uh, you weren't on mute, Craig. Um, but so don't worry, you didn't say anything uh, controversial. <laughs> <laughs> So, so the other thing with like private loans and things like that is typically private lenders want you to have more money up front. So uh, because of those two reasons, it's often better for you to use the conventional or FHA or VA loan. Um, so what I want to do really quickly, just because it'll be easier to share it, is I just want to share some of the... Uh, information with regards to funding your house hack. And again, do want to thank Grid for being uh, the sponsor of this, uh, sorry, the host of this event today. Uh, from my point of view, when it comes to money and thinking about financially, why would you want a house hack? There's really two primary reasons that I see people want to do it. Number one is they don't want to be house poor. So even though they can technically afford that entire mortgage, they don't necessarily want to be house poor. They want to have at least some money in order to still, you know, invest or continue to enjoy themselves. The second is they want to start building a real estate portfolio. And I'm going to go through three different ways for you to do that. So um, I'm going to give you two, three scenarios. The first is if you're buying a single family house. Uh, from a lending point of view. The second is if you're buying a multifamily house. And then the third is if you want to add a new house to your portfolio every one to two years. And Mike has definitely worked with 
all three of these scenarios, and so have I. So uh, if you are um, getting a single family home and you intend to house hack, it does have to be your primary home. Uh, your FICO needs to be a 580 or better. I will tell you that the better your financial profile, the better the terms of the loan are going to be. Um, your down payments are going to range anywhere from 3% to 25%. If you have a W-2 and you've been there um, either for two years or longer, or if you just graduated from college and you can show us college transcripts, then you can get in for three to 5% down. Uh, if you are a uh, a self-employed person, then usually we'll tend to use the bank statement loans, which do require a little bit more of a down payment. Uh, these specific loans are uh, for single family if you're buying a one or two unit property. And one of the big things that you um, must realize is that you have to be able to qualify for the loan entirely on your own without any of that rental income being included. That's not Cherie's guideline or you know Bank of America or anything like that. That is actually a Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac guideline. So any lender you go to is going to have that as a requirement, okay? Which is great what Mike was saying about you may rent out a bedroom in your property and discover, House hacking ain't for me. Um, the, the lender would feel comfortable with knowing that you are not dependent on that income in order to make that mortgage. Okay. So the funding example that we would have here, if you've got a $600,000 townhome in Reston, it's three bed, three bath, and you're putting 5% down. Right now, you're looking at a monthly payment of about 4,000 to 4,800. And I will say this about monthly payments. When lenders look at monthly payments, they look at your principal and interest. They also look at the taxes, insurance, and any HOA or condo fees associated with that. So they take that big number and they say, this is the total monthly payment that we expect you to have for this mortgage. And then they're asking, do you have the ability to pay this loan every single month based on the income that you have? Okay, so um, the rental income, let's say, is $1,000 for you to rent out one or two of those rooms. Then, you know, if you are uh, okay with renting out two rooms, then you've just cut your mortgage in half. So that is one way of looking at this as an example. If you're doing a multifamily, and in this case, multifamily is three or four units, uh, you can, again, get a conventional FHA or VA loan, and you can also get a bank statement loan as well. I apologize for not putting that on here. Uh, 580 credit score. Your multifamily loans are typically going to be 5% down, just to be aware of that. What the bank is going to do is they're going to look at the other, let's say you're getting a four unit. They're gonna look at the other three units. They're going to get the appraiser to tell them, hey, if, if we were to go on the market and put this um, property up for rent, what is the market rental income that we can expect for this? And then what the lender is going to do is they're going to take 75% of that amount and they're going to add that to your W-2 income to say, this is how much you make for your W-2. And then this is the additional money we expect for the um, market rent of, sorry, for the rental income of this property. Do you still qualify for this property based on those factors? All right. So um, again, example here, if you've got a $900,000 fourplex in DC, the market rents are 1800 per unit. You're going to live in one unit and rent out the other three. What the bank is going to do is they're going to say, $1,800 of market rent per unit, 
times 75%. The 75% represents what they call a vacancy rate. So basically they expect the property or the unit to be vacant for two months out of the year. And again, that is a federal Fannie Mae, uh, Freddie Mac guideline, okay? So then we're going to end up with uh, 1350 being the rental income per unit that the bank is going to recognize. So if you multiply that by three units, you get another uh, $4,050 added to your income. So that's how the bank is going to recognize uh, these, these things within your application. And you say, Sheree, what happens if there are tenants that already live in there? And yeah, the market rent is $1,800 a month, but these tenants are paying $2,200 a month. I will tell you right now, we will use the lesser of the two um, numbers. So they're going to look at the market rent and they're going to look at the, the leases from the previous owner or the seller. And they're going to say which one is less. And they're going to use that number. Okay. And then the final thing is, uh, and again, Mike has helped people with this. You may uh, be somebody who wants to buy a house every one to two years. And you may say, I'm going to live in the house. I'm going to rent out a room or two. I'm going to stay there for a year, maybe two years. And then I'm going to buy the next house and rent out that first house completely. And then you do the same thing with house number two. You live there for a year or two, and then you move to a third house and you have the other two rented out. This is a strategy that people use and they use it in order to get into these houses for 5% down, live there for a year or two, minimum one year of living there. Uh, and you're able to then move to the next home that you want to purchase and use this as a strategy in order to build your rental portfolio. So um, you could do this with one to four units. You could do this with any of the loans that are available out there. And you're again, going to put three to 5% down uh, based on your financial profile and what the, um, what the loan itself is. So, um, what should I be aware of when using the, the buying a house every one to two year strategy? Honestly, it is um, the bank, as you're leaving property number one and going into property number two, one of the things that the bank will ask is, do you have the security deposit and the first month's rent for property number one? OK, if you do, then they will count that rental income towards your financial profile. If you do not, then you have to be able to afford house number one's mortgage and house number two's mortgage on your own. So just being aware of this strategy and just kind of, you know, working with me, uh, for example, on thinking about these things being three, four, five steps ahead of um, what could be the roadblocks and you actually getting approved uh, with this strategy. I've had two situations. I had one where the person didn't have um, the first month's rent and security deposit, but because they could afford the mortgage, the second mortgage, it ended up being perfectly fine. And then I had another person who had to go out and get a renter and actually you have to show the receipts that you have and that money needs to be deposited and showing in your bank account before closing, before the bank will actually accept it. So again, these are the kinds of strategies uh, that you need to be aware of as you are using this specific uh, strategy. And I do wanna encourage people to report all of your income on your taxes as well, because it will come up like, hey, you've got three, four, five houses and you're not showing this income on your taxes, what's going on. So just want people to be aware of that um, as you're navigating this. So again, we talked about the different three strategies with regards to lending, 
And um, my number, 571-583-4600, you could call or text, or you could email us um, at Simply Funded. So I'm going to stop that. And Mona is asking, uh, could you repeat that, Sheree? I need to get two months up front from my tenants, first month in security deposit. So it's just first month in security deposit, Mona, and it needs to be deposited into your bank first month in security deposit. So um, please put my, I'm going to Sandra, I'm going to put my contact information into the uh, the chat here. I do want to open it up for questions. You can unmute yourself if you have questions of Mike or I, or go ahead, Mike, I'm sorry. Really quick before that, I, I want to just like reiterate what you said about like things to know when going into this strategy. <clears throat> I've seen more people stumble between one and two than any other new home on their journey. You know, like three to four is easier than one to two. Five mm -hmm. to six is easier than one to two. The reason being is because they don't start with the end in mind. So going back to some of those early questions I ask people, I I always ask like, and this is every buyer consultation investor or not is just kind of like, what is your, what is your vision here? What's your 20 year vision? You know, do you have one? A lot of people don't. Um, they need to, they need to know these things ahead of time. And the reason being is they say they get qualified for 800,000. They go and buy an $800,000 house. When they go to rent it, maybe it doesn't cash flow. Maybe it hemorrhages a little bit of money. Like Cherie said, like with the multifamily, they're looking at 75% of the market rent, not a hundred percent. So it could cash flow in reality, but it's still debt on your DTI. It's working against you on your DTI. So they don't qualify for the next house because they went too expensive on the first. Um, that is like the number one thing that trips people up. So if you want to do this every one to two years and you know that, you have to really dial in the strategy and pick the right first property. If you want to be at the house in the house for 10 years, it's a little less important. You know, like you always want to buy the right property, of course, but like it is critical if you want to do it every one to two years. Um, just knowing that long term strategy, how are you going to get the next one? How are you going to qualify for it? You know, if you're doing a room rental strategy, they're not they're not going to take 100 percent of that income because, you know, you haven't been doing it necessarily. Once you've once you've owned it for a while and you get the second one and you want to turn that first one into a rent by the room and you've done it for a year and you've paid your taxes on it like you're supposed to. Now that's all earned. That's real income and it's going to go towards your income. Um you know, I'm getting a little bit into Sheree's world here and correct me if I'm wrong, but, um, but you know, that, that is a, it's a major thing to think about before you even get started, before you buy the first one, you, you need to have that figured out and you can, you know, you always readjust and, and recalibrate and you can change your strategy, but uh, you just, you don't want to go into it without thinking about how am I going to get number two? When you're buying number one, you need to be thinking about how am I going to get number two? Is this first one helping me towards that? Or is it going to be a hindrance? Um, Cause I, I've, I've had people who they want to do it every one or two years and then life happens. They end up having to sell the first one to buy the second one, but they need to move up in house or their, their situation changes. So they, they can't hold on to the first one. When you buy the first one, if you know you want to build a portfolio, you have to go into it knowing the correct strategy that's going to allow you to hold on to that property. Absolutely. Uh, may I say something? Go ahead. Yeah, go on. Okay. You know, I used to work at Fannie Mae back in the, the, in the day, the 2008, 2009 timeframe when everything collapsed. So you have to understand that this strategy also puts you much more leveraged than, you know, Otherwise, so just in case there's a downturn of 10, 20 percent, can you survive? Because they're going to be calling in, you know, the loans and you better be prepared to sell your house at, in a distressed environment if that needs to happen. Either that or you need to be able to refinance. So um... in those times it's tough to refinance. Well, 
Yeah. So, so I have seen people have issues with regards to, you know, they, they had a credit profile and a financial profile. that was like one way when they purchased the house. And then when it, you know, the downturn happens, like you said, their credit profile is different. Their financial profile is different. And because of that, they cannot keep, keep their properties. So, um, Craig has to well under water. I'm yeah. sorry. They may be well underwater if yeah. they buy high and yes, bad times. Yes, that come. is true. That is true. Uh, especially if you're only putting down 5%. Yes. Right. Um, Craig asked a great question here. Um, I have house hacked my current home. We have a private entrance basement set up as a studio apartment with its own bathroom, laundry, and kitchenette. Is there any risk to rent out the basement and upper levels separately when I move out of my next property? So I'm going to talk about it from a lending point of view, and then Mike can, can chime in from the realtor point of view. The first question I would ask is, does the county recognize this as a one single unit, single family home or two unit home? Because that makes a big difference from a lending point of view. Um, if it is only recognized as a single family home or a one unit property, then the lender is only going to look at it as a one unit property from a financial point of view. They're not gonna look at it as a two unit. And you're saying here, single family. So yes, uh, if, however, there are people and there are 203K loans, for example, where you're able to potentially get some repair uh, money and add walls and, and uh, renovate um, kitchens and bathrooms and things like that. Uh, if you get the permits to change it to a two unit property, then you are able to um, to get that done and, and to have the lender recognize it and recognize both incomes separately. So uh, Mike, what are your thoughts about this? Yes. Um, from my perspective, from the real estate, you know, investing, maximizing revenue perspective, you will make more money doing it that way. That's the that's the plus side. You'll be able to make more money collectively renting out upstairs and downstairs than you will renting out the entire house. Um, now, in terms of drawbacks, you have twice as many leases. You have twice as many tenants, you know, two instead of one. Um, potential infighting. Um, I do have a client who is doing that right now. He, he was living in the basement, renting out the upstairs. He moved. Now he rents out the upstairs, rents out the basement. Um, I, I went to go check on the tenants like a month ago and they are not getting along. A apparently the people downstairs are very loud. The lady upstairs says, I'm not going to re-up my lease. I'm going to leave. And she was a a plus tenant like he's losing an a plus tenant because he put a d minus tenant in the basement so there's that to think about um that's that's the big one it's just you have you know you have two people who knew now have to share a house even if they're not sharing spaces what i tell people is it's you know it's like an apartment if someone lives above you and they're loud or someone lives below you and they're loud you know that's 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 kind of what you're signing up for potentially when you're moving into a situation like that. Like if you're going to move into a house with someone living above or below you, you should know what you're signing up for. But with that said, you might lose a good tenant because you have a bad one in the house. So that's one potential yeah, risk. But I love the strategy, by the way, like I'm, I'm a huge fan of it. Like oh, oh, most of my clients who house hack, when they leave, they, they keep the rented portion rented and then they rent out where they were living. Like most of my clients do that. I love that. Yeah. So this is a great point, Mike, that you mentioned, which is having reserves, you know, um, being a real estate investor like this and using the strategy number three, it's always best to have reserves, having three to six months of mortgage payments so that you can choose the right renter. And some of us live in landlord-friendly states and others of us live in tenant-friendly states. And, and we have to be aware of those things as well. Um, and also using GRID to build out your network of professionals who can help you with um, you know, any kind of tenant issues that you may have. So uh, I'm sorry that that person is going to lose an A-plus tenant because of that. But I think 
I think that's a learning lesson for all of us. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, and I mean, she lived in the home when he bought it. Like she, she was the tenant of the home when he bought it. And she was, you know, she was there years before she stayed the whole time he lived there, continued to be a tenant after he left, like just ex everything you want in a tenant, kept the home beautiful. And then when I saw her, she was like, yeah, my lease up in January and I'm leaving. I was like, ugh. That's a, yeah. that's a tough one. Also, I saw that Din had a question. Yes, I was going to, if you want to read it, yes. Yeah, I feel like we were talking about it a little bit while I think when he posted it. I don't know if we covered it for you or not. If if you have any more on that, um, just let me know. I'm happy to touch on that again. But it it's basically along the lines of like, when you're planning the exit strategy, you really have to understand like, you know, you're putting aside money for vacancy, capital expenses, uh, vacancy, you know, maintenance, all of that stuff. Um, and make, just make sure you have all of that in place. So when you go to get the next one, you have the funds and you're not trapped into the original house. Your debt to income doesn't allow you to move on. Your reserves don't allow you to move on. You don't have the down payment, you know, whatever, et cetera. Um, and, and, and again, it, it is like the single most important thing. If you want to scale, if you want to use this strategy to scale, if you want to do it, every, you know, while you live in a house and you're moving every seven to 10 years, like more of a, a, a typical residential buyer, it becomes a little less important. Um, it's still important. But if you want to do it, you know, every one to three years, it's like it, it, it is just it's so crucial. And, and you have to know. And I and I, I always recommend my clients like if they have the budget, like if they're if they have an eight hundred thousand um, dollar, you know, uh, pre-approval. It's like, hey, are there any houses in the 600s that that can kind of fit what you want? Is that possible? Um, and oftentimes it is. When when you have a, you know, when you're qualified for 550 in my area, Northern Virginia, it it becomes tougher to you're you're probably going to have to spend most of that to find a property that you can house hack. Um, but it's like if you have if you have the ability to go well below what you're approved for on the first one, I just I I highly recommend that to people. Do you uh, recommend people maybe moving further out from like, you know, where their jobs are and things like that? Like what kind of location strategy in order to get underneath, you know, the maximum yeah, amount? If, if they don't mind the commute, I mean, I, I would going under like what you're approved for it, to me in terms of scaling. Like if, if your whole thing is I want to make I want to have a real estate portfolio in 10 years, I want to have five homes something like that. I don't want to house hack them all. I, I mean, I would, I have, I mean, I've absolutely suggested it like, Hey, let's look at a different location. Are you okay with the commute? Like, cause you know, what are you, it, you know, and it goes back to that comfort continuum. Like, what are you willing to sacrifice for your dream? How important is this to you really? Mm -hmm. You know, and some people are like, you know, I've had clients that are like, you know, they, they live on the, they sleep on the couch and rent out every room. You know, like some people are about it. Like they're like, dude, I'll do anything. Like I have a goal. I want to be, I want to be work optional by the time I'm 40 and I'm willing to do whatever it takes. And it's like, let's, let's go get it. Let's do it. You know, other people, not, not as much. So that's, that's a really personal decision. And I never try to steer any, I kind of like try to lay out the facts and like, Hey, here's the options here. I don't want to steer anybody in a direction because it, it is a very personal thing. The better I feel like I know somebody, the more I've worked with them, the more comfortable I'll feel like, dude, this is a bad move for you. Like, I know what you're trying to do and, and this is a bad move and here's why. On their first one, it's more of just like laying out the options and letting them make their decision and living with those consequences. And, you know, I always give my opinion. I let them know what I think, but ultimately you know, it's their, it's their money. It's up to them. Uh, Aluchi, yes, you will get the replay. Everybody will get the replay. So it is being recorded. Um, but great question. Anybody can take themselves off of mute as well. If you have a question, a comment, something we uh, said today. I would like to comment on, you uh -huh. know, just to, uh, I have eight units that I rent out, different houses all over. And I gotten, I've gotten pretty good at um, selecting tenants. I don't have any problems anymore. I had one problem in the beginning, uh, but that taught me a lot. Um, I always be very direct, um, very truthful, 
Um, and just make sure everybody knows what the expectations are. Don't be shy about it. Okay. I always look them in the eye and I say, there's four things. And this is my standard spiel. I say, you have to pay your rent on time every month in full. Two, you got to respect me. Three, you got to respect my property. And four, you got to respect anybody, uh, any neighbors. Those are the four things. And other than that, my nine page lease is just for me to be able to get you out if I have to. I tell them that. I just point blank like that. And good people will, will say, yeah, that makes sense. Bad people will say, yeah, I better get away. And it works. I also have a, uh, a little um, one-page application that says at the top that, I, that they're allowing me to do credit, um, civil, and criminal checks. And I say, is there anything you want to tell me before I do the checks? And they tell me all kinds of stuff. I never do the checks, actually. I never do the checks. But they tell me all kinds of stuff. Anyways, there was another one when I asked the question, is there anything you want to tell me? He said, yeah, I, I hit my girlfriend one time. I knocked out a couple of teeth. But she deserved it. But she deserved it. Nah, I don't think so. <laughs> there, were, I could go on and on. There's many different things like that where people just kind of say, ooh, I better tell him. And they tell me. You don't even have to do the background check. They tell you. It's fun. It's kind of funny. Um, and also you get vibes, too. Mm -hmm. You got to work with the vibes. You get bad vibes, you should stay away from them. Uh, but I've gotten pretty good. I've got good tenants now. They like me. I like them. And... Life is good. If you have good tenants, things work. Mm -hmm. If you have bad tenants, nothing will work. So make sure you get it right on day one with a good tenant. Yeah. And just, it's just my like observation. You make money when you buy. It's just, it's that same thought process. You know, you make money when you buy and you make money before the tenant moves in. You make money Delantas? when they pay their rent. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Delonta, I saw you took yourself off mute. Um, I just had a quick question. I um in the midst of everything, I um heard someone speak about refinancing, and that's something that I was thinking about. Um, like say for example, if you purchase your first home or your second home, um mm -hmm. and go to refinance, what are some contributing factors that may um, that may prevent you from refinancing because uh, I'm th I'm saying that to say, uh, if you go purchase another house, obviously more than likely, um, I'm assuming it's going to hurt your debt to income ratio. So, in terms of refinance, like how would that affect it? Does that make sense? Yeah. So, uh, it may not necessarily hurt your debt to income ratio; it just changes it. So. Uh, one of the big issues that I see when people try to refinance is that their financial profile has changed. So right. uh, either, you know, credit concerns or, uh, you know, lack of income. There's something with regards to their financial profile. Um, the other big thing is people try to refinance and they they make enough money to afford the their current um principal amount but when they try to cash out another three hundred thousand dollars they don't make enough money in order to be able to afford the cash out that they're looking for in order to purchase the next property that honestly i see that a lot more often than a credit score issue is it's the income that you would have uh, another issue that I see is that uh, the market rent for the property will not support, like if you're if you are moving someplace and you've you've got that first rental property, the market rent for that property will not support the refinance with the cash out. 
And like I said, I usually see issues because people are trying to cash out and not just do what's called a rate and term refinance, where all I want to do is get into a lower interest rate and I'm not trying to pull uh, any cash out of the property. So uh, those are the the three big things that that I've seen um, with refis. Mike, do you want to chime in? Have you seen anything else? Um, not not as much on the refi side, but it is um, <clears throat> if you're if you're having to tap equity, even like let's say you qualify to tap to tap the equity in this area because it's an expensive area. What I'll see oftentimes is they're trying to tap equity now. Their new monthly payment, even even if their rate went down a little bit or possibly stay the same, their monthly payment is going up, which now messes up their DTI for the, you know, the following purchase, because if people are trying to take out, you know, if they've gotten all this equity and now they want to refi and, and, you know, keep 20% in or 25% in their, you know, their overall loan is, is growing. I've seen people, tr you know, try that play. Um, <clears throat> but now the, the higher debt, it, it, it makes their debt to income not work for, for the next one. Um, so if you have a cash flowing asset, you you can always tap that equity. But if you're trying to take too much, you can put yourself in a position where you're now you're you you know your debt to income is is no longer advantageous for the next purchase. Yeah, one strategy that people can think of is once you have about twenty five percent equity in that property that is a pure investment property. That can be converted potentially into uh, the investor loan, the DSCR loan. And there are some lenders who uh, report on your credit, and then there are some lenders that don't report on your credit. Um, now, some lenders, as you purchase property number two, three, four, five, six, will scan to see if you own any property, whether or not you have a mortgage on it. So you'll want to be aware of that. Uh, but, you know, there are some clients that do some more um, fancier things uh, in order to have their DTI adjusted accordingly. Uh, and then the reason, the only reason I mention that is because your DTI, your debt to income is based on the mortgages that show up on your credit report. So, yeah, yeah I, I actually have a... Um a friend who he's house hacked nine properties over the last like 12 years about, but he owns all of them and he's getting to, you know, he's like, next one's number 10. Like I need to figure out what the what next he's gonna do. is. And one of the things that we discussed was maybe a, a DSCR loan, mm -hmm. you know, something, you know, refining something like that, because, you know, you can only have those 10. Um, yes. Yeah, government backed primary. But yeah, the conventional or FHA, you can only get half 10. And then there are some banks as well. If you keep going to the same bank and over and over again, they have a cap as well. I had a client that ran into that issue as well. So, other questions or comments that people have, you can just take yourself off the mute. Okay, I don't see anyone taking themselves off mute. Mike, I do want to give you a chance to say any final comments today. Yeah, guys, I mean, in my opinion, and this is why I've really, you know, you know, taken a dive both feet in with house hacking. Like, I really believe it is the single best way to get started in real estate investing. In an expensive market, it can be very tough to save up 20 to 25% down. Um, I'm I'm in Northern Virginia. I'm in an expensive market. Most of my clients are in their 20s or early 30s, and they don't have the funds to, to put 20, 25% down on an investment property. So they turn their primary residence, they put three to 5% down house hack it and then they you know have a strategy to exit and move on it's in my opinion it is the single best way to build a rental portfolio it's a little bit more slow and steady you're not buying three to five homes a year like this you're really buying a house every year or two um, a lot of my clients anywhere between 12 to 24 months is usually their rollover goal like i want to buy every year i want to buy every two years um but you can go even beyond that and uh and I know countless people who have 
five to, to 10 homes and they lived in every single one of them and they're multimillionaires and they did not do anything special or crazy. They did something that almost anybody can do. You know, it, it really isn't, you don't need to have, you don't need to make a half million dollars a year to do this. You, you know, you don't, you don't need to go out of your way to find these incredible off-market deals. You know, it's, it's very simple, low friction. Anybody can do it. So like, if you're an agent, I, I, whether my clients tells me they want a house hack or not, I bring it up to every single person who's buying a house. I'm like, Hey, is this something you'd be, you, know, you would consider just because I believe it in it so much as a wealth builder. It's, it is like the It is the best way to start, especially if you're in an expensive market. Yeah. And I, I would just I, say, if anybody who's lived through the the financial crisis back in the 08, 09 uh, time frame, you just got to watch the leverage or you can get caught uh, if you're mm -hmm. living on the edge and then there's a downturn, you're going to go bankrupt. You're going to go bankrupt. I've saw so many of those things. Uh, so just be careful and always figure on like a 20% market downturn. Could you, can you survive if somebody's calling in the loans? And if you're underwater, you're bankrupt. Yeah. So be careful. And I just want to say uh, that Start with the end in mind, as Mike was saying and other people were saying in the chat here, start with the end in mind, working with me, for example, um, being able to say, hey, Sheree, like Mike is saying, I, I want to own five properties in 10 years. Okay, great. Well, then let's start with that strategy and let's make sure that we're setting up financially, we're setting up that first property so that it does not negatively impact property number two, three, and four. Um, and also just recognize that your income oftentimes can be more important than your credit score when it comes to the debt to income ratios. I will say as a lender, a lot of the time it's, it is the income portion of either your W-2 or the property itself the market rent is not high enough for us to take the vacancy factor out and still have the numbers work. So uh, other than that, I, you know, I work with a lot of people who will say, hey, Sheree, I'm thinking of putting an offer in on this property. Are the numbers going to work? And I'm able to calculate them really quickly and let people know uh, what's possible. Um, but yeah. So yeah. it's and 159. Go ahead, Mike. Really quick, just to double tap on that. Absolutely is the income thing. And that is why in my market specifically, where you cannot buy a house, put 5% down and have it cash flow as a, as a 12 month lease, as like a single unit, which is mm -hmm. what they're going to be running. The bank is going to be running their numbers off that. Mm -hmm. So if you want to buy another house in a year or two, you got to give yourself room in the original purchase. You, you can't max it out or there's just no chance you're going to be able to buy that second one. Once you get the second one, Maybe you take the first one and rent it midterm or buy the room and you start collecting that income, pay taxes on it. Now they can count all of that income. Yes. But in, in from one to two, you, you, you can't go all out on one if you want to scale quickly. It's just. You know, yeah. And, they, and we need two years, two years on your taxes in order to recognize that income. So uh, just be aware of that as well. So. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. Mike, how do people get reach out to you? Yes, I will. I'll put in the chat my um, my email address and my phone number. And yeah, if you ever want to talk anything, uh, real estate investing, house hack specific, but, you know, I help people by short terms. I've helped a lot of people by midterms. Um, you know, I'm an investor myself. So I just, you know, I like talking real estate investing. So reach out to me. I'm always happy to help. Yeah. Uh, Mike also runs Grid Reston. So if uh, you are in the Reston area and you want to talk real estate investing once a month, the first Tuesday of every month, uh, Mike is uh, leading the Grid Reston group as well. So you can meet other investors and, and talk strategy. And I'm usually there myself. So uh, we want to give people a couple of minutes in order to grab Mike's information 
And we just want to thank everybody for being here today. And we will send out the replay. And we'll also make sure to have Mike's contact information in there and mine. And then we'll have another money discussion next month as well. So 